Introduction to Mass Communications, a Briarcliff College telecourse. Your instructor is Associate Professor of Mass Communications, Ralph Swain. Part 1, Lesson 1, Pre-Revolutionary Media and the Communication Process. Please have note paper and your course handbook ready. This lesson is approximately 60 minutes in length. Pre-revolutionary media is uh, what I want to get into first before we get into the lectures on the communication process. And the reason I talk about pre-revolutionary media, meaning before uh, 1776, is because of the uh, interest in knowing how journalists and printers were treated in England and in the early colonies of the United States. And since the United States was settled by uh, mostly, at least initially, people from uh, the old country of uh, England, uh, it's important to follow the pattern of treatment of journalists and uh, printers. There was an organization in England called the Stationers Company, which uh, is really a 16th, 17th century phenomenon. And basically what the, what the Stationers Company did was to license printers throughout the city of London. And later, um, organizations were set up by the government to license printers throughout Great Britain. But the Stationers Company also was a monopoly on the printing trade in England. What it means is that you basically had to have a license to print. And the only place you could get that license was from the Stationers Company. They issued the licenses. They also, uh, to a great extent, were the government printers for the uh, royal kingdom. They were also an auxiliary police unit, which means that they had police powers. They could shut down printing presses. They could initiate arrests of <coughs> printers. And of course, when you mention printers, you can't avoid talking about journalists, because journalists were also printers. And they also had the power to conduct searches. So they could, if they suspected that a, an errant printer was printing without a license or printing material which uh, was, a, was fomenting uh, bad thoughts about the government, what they call sedition, they could very easily go in without a warrant, search the premises, and seize property. An example, William Carter in the 1584, that's about as far back as I'll go, 1584, he was a printer in England. He published a pamphlet uh, that allegedly was designed to incite the women of the Queen's court to assassinate the Queen. Okay. What he used in this pamphlet was called allegorical illusion. Al allegorical illusion is a literary form that is basically an indirect reference to a literal character. So in other words, he didn't say in his pamphlet and, uh, that the Queen of England was the subject of an assassination plot. But in using allegorical illusion, the characters in the pamphlet, by the reader's perception, could very easily be interpreted as the Queen of England. Well, any time that you voiced opposition, disrespect for the government. That was considered treason. The government was sacrosanct, particularly when it came to print. And that's why printers were licensed. And once printers were licensed, whatever they printed also had to be looked at, in some cases censored, and in other cases shut down. So they charged William Carter. The trial took a single afternoon. Here's the sentence for William Carter. He was to be hanged, which he was. He was then to be disemboweled and quartered. Does anybody know what quartered means? 
How was that done? How do you quarter somebody? Exactly. They would take four horses, draft horses, they would, with the traces, tie up each arm and each leg, and then the four horses would go in the four directions of the compass and literally pull you apart. Now, in his case, he was dead before they did that. They also quartered people while they were alive. So rather than outright execution, our forefather, basically believed that pain and punishment before death was important in showing justice. And a lot of that, of course, carried over into the colonies. And when the colonies became the United States, we, among other things, of course, proceeded to eliminate these inhumane forms of punishment and death. Now, that's one country, that's England, and that's where, our her where basically the, the heritage initially of the United States began. Uh, and later on, on, of course, immigrants from many other countries came to form the United States. There was another organization run by the Crown called the Court of the Star Chamber. Now, the Court of the Star Chamber was also a 16th and 17th century phenomenon. It was abolished in 1641 by a new king who felt this was going way beyond human decency. But the Court of the Star Chamber set a series of decrees up which outlined specific punishments for illegal practices. And among the illegal practices was the, were the practices of printers, journalists, violating the law in some respect, whether it was printing without a license, or whether it was printing with a license, but printing words which would be considered seditious. Sedition is publication or words in opposition to your government. Okay. Now, there were two forms of law in England. There was the common law courts, and generally in the common law courts you had trial by jury. And usually the lesser crimes were tried in the common law courts. The more serious crimes could then go to uh, judges who, um, for example, sat on the court of the Star Chamber. Well, when an, uh, an example was that Dr. Alexander Layton, who was a Scottish clergyman in 1630, was charged also with seditious literature. Uh, the hideous punishments could be meted out by the judges on the court of the Star Chamber and did, and they did. In the case of Alexander Layton, for example, he was charged with treason and um, a sedition because he stated again in a pamphlet that the clergy of the Church of England was antichrist and satanical. So he was attacking the clergy of England, of the Church of England. That was considered blasphemy and also treasonous because the church was closely tied in with the government. A lenient common law jury did not convict Dr. Layton. So the court of the Star Chamber decided to impose stiffer sentences so that their judges could then impose punishment against Layton. And the Star Chamber did just that. And here's a sentence against Layton. Now we're up to 1630. He was, number one, degraded from the ministry, which means he was uh, defrocked, excommunicated. He was then pilloried and whipped. Who knows what a pillory is? P-I-L-L-O-R-Y. Anybody know what a pillory is? Okay. A pillory is a device that is on a post and you lock your hands inside and your head. So you're in a standing position, you have to bend over, your head is locked in in your hands. And they're placed in public locations. The other type was called stocks, other type of punishment. Stocks 
you sat down and they locked your legs into a wooden frame. And again, you were placed in a public location from pillories and stocks. Then, once you were in the pillory, uh, Dr. Layton was whipped publicly. They then took a knife and slit his nose. They branded one side of his face with a hot brand. And then they hacked off one of his ears. This is for publishing. They gave him one week to recover from his wounds with not a great amount of medical attention. And then they took him to the poor side of London and performed the same punishment for the, poor, the benefit of the poor people. That was a kind of entertainment in those days. So they re-slit the nose, they hacked off the other ear, and they branded the other cheek. After the brutal punishment, they uh, committed him to prison where he languished. Another example, John Twin, T-W-Y-N, a printer, um, had published a pamphlet that was a treatise on the execution of justice. Now, in the treatise on the execution of justice, as you can imagine from the title, he was somewhat critical of the judicial system in England and uh, government practices. And of course, when you were critical of your government, that could be considered sedition, and in the worst case, a capital crime, treason. He was charged with fomenting rebellion in addition to uh, being charged with treason and sedition. So the sentence was, number one, he was pressed, okay? Pressing means you were actually put in a device that was like a vice, your whole body. And then a person on the payroll of the crown who works in the chambers where these interesting devices were kept, slowly tighten a wooden screw that would bring down this vice on top of your body. And they would continue to apply the pressure in the hopes that the pressure would elicit a confession, not, a, not to mention what you ate for breakfast and everything else. Uh, believe it or not, John Twin uh, did not succumb to the pressure of torture. They wanted to get him to come up with the name of the author who presented this pamphlet to, hi to him to print, because he, he was a licensed printer. So since torture didn't work to get him to confess or to get him to reveal the name of the person who wrote the document, they passed the following sentence. And I'm just going to quote. You shall be publicly hanged and while still alive shall be cut down. Your privy parts shall be cut off. Your entrails shall be taken out and burnt before your eyes. And then finally your head shall be cut off and your body quartered. At the point when the head is cut off, he ended his suffering. But up until that point, he was still alive. They became masters at disemboweling. And a trained executioner could take a sword or a sharp instrument and with one fast swack at your stomach could uh, have your entrails fall out and really not cut any vital arteries or whatever. So basically, you would be alive, but your guts would be hanging out. And then as further punishment, physical and psychological, of course, at that point, the, the trauma is probably so great, psychology doesn't even figure in here. But anyway, they would burn your entrails in front of you while you were still squirming. Now, does this sound like civilized people? Well, we're talking about a couple of centuries ago, not too far away from the American Revolution. Alexander Layton was pun punished in 1630. The colonies were already being established in, in, uh, in the New World. We're barely over 100 years away from the American Revolution and, of course, eventually the Constitution of the United States. The final sentence after, of course, all this pain and punishment was enacted was that the head and the quarters, meaning the two arms and the legs that now had been separated from the rest of the body, um, would be disposed of at His Majesty's pleasure. Now, most of the sentences always ended with those words, at His Majesty's pleasure, meaning that the King of England 
could then decide the final resting pace of the parts of your body. That sounds really gruesome, and it is. Um, I mean, what, what are we imagining? That, that the king gets up on the wrong side of the bed or has an argument with the queen, uh, he may take a head out and lawn bowl with it or do some things like that before he buries it. I mean, what, what do we mean by the, His Majesty's pleasure? Well, that, that kind of gives you the feeling of the times, the fact that civilization, as we call it, wasn't very civilized even a couple of hundred years ago. But this is our heritage, and this is the heritage of journalists. This is the heritage of people that publish and that print. It's a very short history, because until 1790-91, when finally the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia finally ratified the, the Bill of Rights along with the Constitutional document, is the beginnings of really the first country in the history of the world to establish freedom to publish. That's not that long ago. Okay, not even 3, uh, 300 years ago. So in, a, in effect, we're still, in a great respect, learning about journalism, freedom of speech. And I think that is why that there is still a lot of misunderstanding about how much freedom should there be, and at what point are media going too far, and at what point does government figure in, at what point does the church figure in. And every country basically has a different form or respect for freedom of the press. And basically there's probably more countries that have a lesser respect for freedom. And that usually happens when there's trauma. Let's take Panama as an example. Just until a few months ago, here was a country that was relatively stable politically, that had a strong military in control, and because of one individual, the general in charge, was indicted in this country because of uh, direct hand, according to the evidence, of uh, running drugs and using his country for shipping drugs to basically the United States, and maybe his connections with the I Iran Contra or the Contra aid scandal has initiated terrible turmoil in Panama. That country can overnight go up into uh, political disturbances, and it already has the beginnings of that. What is the first thing that General Noriega is going to do and has already done when he suspects that the public is starting to believe the charges and are ready to do something about getting a civilian government in Panama? What, what is the first action that's usually taken by any country? when it looks like there's going to be some very serious unrest. Ann? Ann Studer? Okay. Of anything in particular? What would you first take control of if you were a military general in charge of a country? Okay, media. Right. And that's exactly what happens in almost every single case when there's political turmoil to the point that it looks like the country's <coughs> going to become divided. The first thing that, ha that falls is freedom of the speech and press. And you shut down the opposition. And in the case of Panama, they, ha they had some goons working for the military that actually went into a radio station that had broadcasted a, an announcement to support the civilian president who was in hiding, and they totally destroyed the station. They destroyed it. They went in and smashed all the equipment, knocked it off the air. And that's how a, a government, a legal government, can deal, in the most extreme examples, with the press. And basically a country friendly to the United States up until recently. Okay. So the press is hangs on a thread in many countries. 
and it can hang on a thread even in the United States and has from time to time during the McCarthy era in the 1950s, during the Vietnam War, during World War I, we had more laws passed restricting freedom of the press in the country. Generally, press restrictions are applied heavily during times of war or turmoil. And those are the times, perhaps, that the press is the most needed of free press, so that the public at large can know what's going on, because rumors go rampant during these periods of time. Another person who figures in on early pre-revolutionary development of the uh, journalistic profession is someone by the name of Sir Roger Lestrange, and strange he was. He had the title of surveyor of the imprimary. Basically, the surveyor of the imprimary, I-M-P-R-I-M-E-R-Y, from the word imprimatur, means chief hunter of the outlaw printers. That's what he was. That basically was his job description. Imprimatur is uh, the, a set of codes and laws that, that deals with uh, speech and press freedoms. Uh, so he was the head honcho that, under the Court of the Star Chamber, enacted these uh, punishments. And to show you the kind of personality that uh, Sir Roger had, uh, he had the power to enter and search any printing office or bookshop without a warrant for any reason or any suspicion of any illegal publication or whatever. He could confiscate anything that he desired for evidence, which could be used against the, uh, the owners of the printing press or the author of the document. And he is quoted as saying, you obliterate the errant authors and you obliterate the problem. And he really believed that. And when he used the word obliterate, he meant obliterate. He had no tolerance for anyone that had loose lips or a loose printing press. And you've already seen some of the sentences that the Court of the Star Chamber and Sir Roger Lestrange recommended and performed on errant uh, publishers and uh, authors. So he basically advocated the, the penalties of death, mutilation, banishment, and corporal pain, not necessarily in that order, obviously. Corporal pain was considered a justifiable method of punishment for anyone who broke the law in, in England. Okay, any questions about this pre-revolutionary era? Okay, the reason I cover it and the reason it gets gross is because it was, but is to show you that it's not something you take for granted. That it's not something that was handed down from our forefathers and from our ancestors from the old country. It is something new and distinct to the United States of America, which other countries, not all of them, may be copied after 1890s and our Constitution. And the very countries that subscribe to our Constitution and a First Amendment freedom of speech, many of those countries also violate it constantly, day in and day out. And in the cases like Panama and some of the other countries, uh, overnight can suspend freedoms uh, or do it constantly, like in South Africa, where the white majority government ha expects that to be the rule. The government has complete control over what is said and where the media go, what they shoot, what they publish, and so forth. Let me move now to, to more modern day era and talk about the theory of what we call the communication process. <clears throat> Some of you may have noticed in your readings or uh, in discussion that mass communication can be spelled two ways. It can be spelled with an S at the end of communication, and you would assume it means plural, or without the S. So to get this straight right now, because I, there may even be English teachers that aren't quite clear on this, it's not grammatical. 
what it is is that mass communication without the S refers to the theory, the theoretical process of communication, of which I'm going to start covering now. Mass communications with the S refers to the mechanical means, i.e., the media, the process of communicating from one source to the other using the mechanical, electronic, whatever means. So in that case, in the Department of Communications here at Briar Cliff, it is called the Mass Communications Department rather than Mass Communication. At the University of Pittsburgh, they have a Mass Communication Department because they're almost 100% theory oriented. You can go as far as a PhD in communication and never touch a video camera, a radio, um, do an internship in any uh, active commercial media related field. It's, it's research and theory. So there's the differences. It's not a misspelling or plural versus singular. I'm going to show you an overhead chart that covers the uh, basic um, functions of the communication process. Basically, the, uh, there are four functions of the media, as you'll notice in your handbook and in the textbook. One is information. The second is entertainment, the third is persuasion, and the fourth is the transmission of culture. And believe me, the media do transmit culture. Hopefully, in most cases, to my understanding and hope, the media tend to mirror culture. But I tend to think, and I think a lot of other people believe this too, that also the media, because of its power and different types of media, not only mirror culture, but in some cases shape culture. And that's where the problems sometimes arise, particularly with the general public and the government. Is, does the media have a role to shape culture or simply to mirror culture? On this particular graphic, you'll notice what we call the SNR process, which is the stimulus response process. It's a theory. And it applies in psychology, but it also applies in communication. Stimulus response, because in psychology, a lot of experiments are done with animals, whether it's rats or whatever, and you need to prove a theory. In many cases, in order to prove that theory, you need to get into testing stimulus and then the response to the stimulus. In mass communication, it's basically the interaction between a source and a receiver. And what the receiver is receiving, obviously, is a message of some sort, a form of communication. So we have, number one, what is called channel noise. Uh, channel noise is uh, anything which interferes with the message. And on the graph, you will notice that there is the source, which is also called the encoder, the receiver, which is called the decoder, and then there's the channel, meaning the message. And then there's a, another aspect called feedback, which is vital. Because feedback is information, whether it's visual or oral, that goes from the receiver of the message, the communication, back to the sender. And there's many forms of feedback that can come. For example, when you're talking to someone casually in the hall, you're getting instant feedback, whether you're aware or not, just by the things that you're saying to that person. And it can be interpreted in body language, it can be interpreted in facial expressions, and it can be interpreted orally in what they say back to you in response to what you're telling them. And there's forms of feedback for the more distant forms of communication, such as television. There's still the opportunity to have feedback in TV, even though you're in your living room watching TV and the station manager and the news director and so forth are back at the station. There's an opportunity for feedback, but it's not instant. Whether it's picking up the phone or sending a letter or some other form. You may bump into the general manager on the street corner and say, hey, uh, you know, I saw your production last night and yeah, uh, it was okay, except I disagree with this. You're giving feedback to that person. So there's a, a, the, the most basic form of communication, the theory of, of mass communication. Semantic noise, as I said, and channel noise are two forms. The channel noise is interference from within or from, without, from outside the channel itself. 
Okay, what's an example of that? Static on a radio is a form of channel noise because when you get static on your radio, it's interfering with the message. Another form could be in a live situation, traffic sounds. You're standing in a street talking to a friend and a loud truck goes by. That's creating channel noise. You may have to raise your voice. You may have to repeat yourself. So there is always the possibility of noise interfering with the message. The second type of noise is called semantic. This is more of a psychological type of noise. Semantic noise is interference from within the communication process itself. Example, you're talking to someone from another country or even from a different part of this country and they have a heavy accent. You may have trouble understanding what they're saying. That is semantic noise. It is not channel noise. Semantic noise can also be affected by differences in occupation, education, socioeconomic status, and so forth. Much more subtle forms of interference with the message. You may, for example, be approached by a derelict in the street, and the derelict has his hand out asking for a quarter. Now, your first reaction may be, ooh, um, uh, get away. What is happening is semantic noise. Your stereotyping of this derelict and your feelings about the way the person's dressed or their socioeconomic status is interfering with the clear message that he's trying to give you. Please give me a quarter. I'm hungry. Now, a humanitarian <coughs> generally may have less problem with semantic noise if they are more comfortable in working with people in different socioeconomic backgrounds and they have a humanitarian concern, that semantic noise is not going to exist. They're going to listen and they're going to make a decision whether to give that person a quarter or not. But they're not going to necessarily totally judge that based upon semantic noise which has no relationship to the direct request which is the message. And now you can see where semantic noise feeds into such things as prejudice, stereotypes, biases. This is all forms of noise that really interfere with the direct message. And in, in, in a great respect, the United Nations concept is a means of trying to eliminate semantic noise between nations. Let's put our differences aside. Let's sit down and talk. Even if we can't understand each other's language, we've got translators so we can communicate commonly. Let's talk about the problems. Let's not worry about the semantic noise that's interfering with the problem of communication. So in the greatest respect, if you extrapolate that to the furthest extent, the United Nations may be a concept of communication, mass communication, that tries to eliminate most of all semantic noise from communication and get down to some problem solving. Okay, the word journalese is important because journalese is a f word, again, and I say there's many words and terms in this profession that only apply to the profession as it does in many different professions. They have their own language. Journalese uh, is a form of writing that is developed through journalism to enhance or simplify the process of communication. That's basically journalese. A form of writing that can enhance or simplify the communication, mass communication. And journalese, very basically, is what is called in the, in the profession the five W's and the H. Anybody want to take a stab at what the five W's or the H are? <laughs> yes. There you go. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. If you can get to the most simplistic form of journalism, there are six words that determine journalese, how you communicate 
quickly to the, to the reader, the listener, the viewer, whatever. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. Now, in journalism 101 classes throughout the United States, you know, basic journalism, as uh, students are taught, that if you write a story and you leave out any of the five W's or the H, which is a how, <laughs> which is very important, you're going to not get an A on the grade on the paper. And it probably certainly would not get published because you're missing a vital element in the story. The purpose then of news journalism, journalese, is to get to the nitty gritty and tell the public an answer to those five W's and the H, those six words. So they came up with what's called the inverted pyramid style of writing. Inverted pyramid. The inverted pyramid, if you can imagine, a pyramid standing on its point, representing the story, a print story. The top or the widest part of the inverted pyramid represents the meat the body of the story, the who, what, why, when, how, okay, and where. And then as you continue in your writing, as your sentences and paragraphs follow to develop the story, you're getting into the point, the narrow part of the pyramid, which is standing on its head. The purpose of that is that information of lesser importance is supposed to gradually, sequentially follow the most important information, which is the five W's and the H. Now you say, why? Just to make it easy for the reader to know right off the top of the story? Sure, that's part of it. Because stories can be lengthy, and they certainly were a lot lengthier in the old days than they are now. But reading to many people is a slower process, obviously, than listening to radio newscast or television or whatever. And so you wanted to get the most important information at the top of the story. But there was another very interesting reason why they developed that. And basically, the inverted pyramid style has its beginnings during the Civil War. The reason is that during the Civil War, which was the most traumatic event in American history, American history, I mean, since 1776, up until that moment. Because here, for the first time, the nation was fighting itself. We had a civil war. We lost one and a half million Americans killed. And what happened was it became the most newsworthy event of the 1860s, not only for the United States journalists, but worldwide. A total of 400 journalists from the United States and foreign countries on the average, covered the Civil War during the four years of fighting that took place in this country. Now, if you can imagine a time when telegraph was invented, no telephones, and of course no video, no satellite, no other form of communication other than telegraph. Uh, telegraph depends on the Morse code. So you had to have trained operators to be able to tap out all the letters of the alphabet very quickly and send whole sentences and paragraphs. Whenever you send communication, not only is the military interested in that, but the journalists are interested because we're talking about their profession. So as these journalists followed around the Civil War, whether it was from the southern side or the northern side, they had to get their hands on a telegraph key and feed their story to New York or wherever they're their editor was. And in a time of war, you had lots of problems. Number one, the enemy could be shimming up a telegraph pole and cutting the wires. And it would make sense to bang out the five W's and the H right off the bat before the wires are cut. Other problems were you may have two or three other journalists from competing newspapers behind you saying, you got five minutes and you're off that wire because I'm next. And so you had to get the meat of the story out. You couldn't sit there and, and take your jolly old time and write a literary story from a telegraph key under combat conditions. Also, the military had control of the telegraph, the civilian telegraph. And if you were covering uh, the Union or the Confederate Army, if you were lucky enough to get 
into using the telegraph, the general in charge may say, you've got five minutes and then get off it. And so again, you were under these constraints, these deadlines, these pressures. So again, the inverted pyramid style came in handy and of course developed out of the Civil War primarily and then became such a fixture in the journalism field that it's still basically considered the form, the most basic form of journalism for print publication. Now I say print because in broadcasting, really uh, in news broadcasting you don't have an inverted pyramid, you have almost what's called a, uh, a rectangle. In other words, broadcasting is so constrained and shortened that everything that you type ha gets on the air. You don't slice the last paragraph or you lose the story. The inverted pyramid was helpful back in New York City in the editor's office because the editors did slice the end of your story and that still works today. Since the beginnings of commercial print, this is how it works. When you set up your paper, you have to have advertising if you're a commercial paper to survive. So the first items that go in the newspaper are ads. If you go to Sioux City Journal, you go to Des Moines Register, New York Times, any paper, and you walk into the, uh, the composing room, uh, let's say out many hours before the paper is to go to the presses, what you will see are layout sheets representing every page of the paper spread out on light tables or drafting tables. And you will see toward the bottom of the page all these elements pasted up in the paper. And if you look closely, you'll notice they're mostly ads. And then you have white spaces near the top. And that's called the news hole. The news hole is the last generally to be laid down. Okay? You get the ads in first. Because you're getting money for those, you have a commitment to get them in. Stories can be cut, killed, edited. So stories, believe it or not, do not have the priority that advertising does. So generally today, you have a 60-40 split, meaning the ratio of the average newspaper in the United States, commercial paper, is 60% advertising or non-news, non-editorial material. 40% news slash editorial material. And when I say editorial, it, it, it can mean a column, letters to the editor, whatever. Anything that is not an ad, whether it's classified or display ad, legal notice or anything like that. 60-40, 60 60% ads, 40% news editorial. So then what does the editor do? Well, you've got news holes and you've got so many stories you have to fill. A properly run newspaper has to have lots of backup copy, something that we at the campus newspaper wished we had every two weeks, always pushing to get plenty of backup copy. But newspapers generally have lots of backup copy because the wire services provide reams and reams of news and you only see a very small fraction of the news that is coming across the wires. So then the editor selects and decides, and different department editors decide what news is going on on what page and so forth, and many pages are designated for specific news and sports. So now you're limited to specific pages. So the next thing you have to do is select the stories. These are then typeset in the proper column size, and then these long strips are then pasted up in the paper. Now, with the advent very recently of desktop publishing, Desktop publishing meaning computerized publishing, the ability to formulate the entire page on a computer. Um, the paste up uh, angle is going to become less and less important because the computer can spit it out on a laser printer, the whole page, all columned and everything. But still a great number of newspapers <coughs> are still uh, in the paste up stage. So you take a story and let's say you've got a news hole on a page that's eight column inches long. The editor is handed a story that goes on that page that is 12 column inches long. It won't fit. What's the editor going to do? Take the story back to the person who wrote it and say, rewrite it, and, but rewrite it to eight column inches? You don't have time for that. He's got a lot of news holes to fill. 
So he or she will take the scissors out or the razor blade, go up to eight, in, eight column inches and cut and throw away, discard the tail of the story. What's in the tail? The point of the pyramid. What's supposed to be the content of the point of the pyramid? Lesser important supportive material that's backing up and meeting out the story of the five W's and the H. So there's another third or fourth example of why the inverted pyramid style in print journalism is significant. It's constrained by physical problems attendant with the layout of a newspaper. And that's how it works. I want to talk about gatekeepers. And again, some of this uh, is a little bit of review when you get into the book because uh, some of these items are covered in the book, but also um, they're very important. They could also appear on uh, exams. And uh, I want you to be fully aware of what some of these terminologies are. Here is a gatekeeper, a list of potential gatekeepers. A gatekeeper basically is an individual who has editing control of the message. And when I say editing control, that can mean total control of eliminating the story altogether to simply making some minor changes in the story. So let's take the top example. Here we have an event, whatever that is. We have an event taking place. And we have, if it's what we call a hard news story or a breaking story, that means that the event is taking place unbeknownst to the news media. A soft story generally is a story that the media know is going to happen. It's coming up, it's pre-planned, and they can be there to cover it. In a breaking story, it takes place on its own. Give me some examples of a breaking story. What would be a story that the media would have no knowledge is happening but is a critical news story? Someone up here. Just make something up, a story, an incident, whatever. A murder, OK? So generically, we're talking crime. Typical. A crime story is a breaking story. Give me an example over here of a soft news story. Any example. Say that again. A press conference. You know what else? label a press conference has, besides being a soft story? And, and believe it or not, let me clarify that. A press conference can be a hard story. And here's the difference. The press conference, from the standpoint of being pre-planned so the media know it's happening. By the way, there's one, one that took place at 2 o'clock today over at Noonan with, uh, with the uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Boyer, on campus. The, press conference uh, is set up ahead of time, and then the media are called and said and asked to come and attend. But it can be a hard press conference. So for example, President Reagan's press conference is a hard news story, simply because of his stature and his position. The President of the United States makes a statement that's considered hard news. Okay. But in the, in the generic sense, as I'm talking, difference between soft and hard, pre-planned versus unplanned, except by the perpetrator of the story. Uh, there's the difference. So let's, let's use this example as a, so, as a hard news story, OK? You have an event occur. The media know nothing about it. So an eyewitness, however, sees the event take place. The eyewitness is basically the first gatekeeper to the story, all right? The reason is that when the reporter arrives on the scene to interview that eyewitness, to ask, him or her what happened or what they saw, depending on the, what the person feels they saw or heard, and their own built-in pressures, their own built-in biases is going to tell the reporter what they think happened. That's the first gatekeeper. And a smart reporter is not going to depend on one eyewitness. You're going to get back up and the police and other people that you're going to eventually call. The second gatekeeper then actually becomes a reporter. Because every single reporter, no matter how good or bad they are, and there are bad and good reporters, the reporter has to then sit down and write the story from notes. 
And whatever the reporter puts in those notes or leaves out of the notes is a gatekeeping function. The reporter may think during the interview that some of the information being fed to him or her is not important to put in the notes, and therefore that may not end up in the story. So again, there's some editing decisions made by the reporter. There's a gatekeeping function. Then it goes, let's say, to the city editor. If the paper has a city editor, medium large markets would have a city editor assigned to city uh, news. The city editor is a major gatekeeper because the city editor would decide, unlike the reporter, whether to even put the story in the paper at all. And that's a very crucial position to be in. And it's also a hot seat position to be in because the public can complain vehemently to et these editors if something doesn't appear in the paper that they think they sh that shouldn't appear in the paper, or if a story is buried in the paper that they feel should have had greater prominence or any other problems that may arise. And then there's a managing editor. And the managing editor, and the Sioux City Journal has city editors and managing editors, uh, who is more or less the top dog from the standpoint of editorial decision making. And it's a managing editor who makes the final decision on that particular edition of the paper as it comes out. And so that person is in, in many cases, a greater hot seat than the city editor because they are the chief, if you could use the quote, censor of the paper. They certainly wouldn't admit they're censors, but everybody that's involved in the gatekeeping function in one way or another is exercising a certain amount of control, and um, censorship is a form of control, although it's a hard word. We don't like to throw censorship out. We refer to that word more to mean deliberate um, uh, prevention of, of important news reaching the public. And then finally, I have the paper carrier, the newsstand, or the post office. But notice the little rectangle is uh, dotted. Uh, my way of saying, eh, could be a gatekeeper, OK? The reason that the paper carrier could be a gatekeeper and always has that onus on his or her shoulders is because as the snow melted in front of our house and the ice that built up over this past winter, we went out to kind of look around, see how much damage was done to the, the uh, plantings. And lo and behold was um, the January 12th edition of the Sioux City Journal. And of course, this was March when we found the paper. <laughs> The carrier had thrown the paper, missed the porch, and it ended up in a snowdrift. And it snowed that day, obviously. And I, it'd be very easy to check, go back to January 12th and see what kind of weather we had. Or maybe we were out of the house at the time and spaced out getting the paper. But in any event, the paper ended up in a snowdrift. And many weeks later, there it is. Did I bother to open it up and read it? No. It was soggy to begin with. And who likes to read old news, especially that old? So the, the, the paper carrier was a gatekeeper because of his lack of ability and his arm to throw that paper in the proper place. And when, when these gatekeepers really start exercising uh, lack of agility and getting the paper on your porch, complaints go in to the boss, and they may replace the paper carrier or admonish them to make sure they take a little more care in getting the paper up there. The newsstand is a gatekeeper because you may get to the newsstand and it's sold out. Or the newsstand doesn't carry your paper or for some mess up didn't get that edition of the paper. And uh, they performed an unplanned gatekeeping function. The post office can be a gatekeeper too if you get your journal by mail. And when we lived in Jefferson, South Dakota, we got it by mail. There were no mail carriers out there. So it got there late in the afternoon, but you still got it the same day. And what happens? Well, sometimes you got two papers in the same day, and one paper was a day late. So in a way, the gatekeeping function is also performed by the post office. And finally, it gets to the reader, and the reader then, after all this process, hopefully is getting the news that that particular reader hopes will inform them intelligently entertainingly about what happened in the past basically 24 hours in the world. 
Now, the journal is not going to claim it's going to tell you everything that happened in the world, and neither will the New York Times. But because of the size and the economics viability of the New York Times, you're going to learn a heck of a lot more what happens in the world by reading a paper like the New York Times. But you're not going to learn anything about Sioux City, or very little, by reading the New York Times. So each paper has its function. This concludes part one, lesson one, of the Introduction to Mass Communications Telecourse. There is one lesson remaining in part one.